What even is a long-running Nintendo series without the eventual remake? As the oldest console maker still in the business, series that have traditionally stuck to the company, especially those that first debuted in 8-bit, all eventually choose to resurrect the past in their then-modern glory. In times of uncertainty, it's natural to want to go that way. Not only do you allow new fans to catch up, but you also allow your old fans to reminisce for a bit. As long as it's not overdone, it's a harmless way to shore up enthusiasm, especially when recent fate has not been going your way. Fire Emblem 11 Shadow Dragon is easy to call just another remake, but I find that to be a bit dismissive. Fire Emblem 1 wouldn't have led to this, and neither would Mystery of the Emblem. Shadow Dragon is what it is due to the decade plus of series development that came after all these titles. Despite taking place on the same maps, this is very much its own Fire Emblem. I was often asked at the beginning of the series if I would even bother to play the quote-unquote remakes, as if just playing one of these completely removes the history, importance, and context of the others. Like with the very recent, as of my writing, Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes, the experience of playing the original versus the remade versions can be leagues different. Just because this is less obvious in a strategy RPG doesn't make this any less true. This is important to remember, because Shadow Dragon can be too easily brushed aside. To the casual observer, it is tempting to just take one look at it and call it ugly, or to call it simple, but to just leave it at that would be an utter shame. Shadow Dragon is a bit ugly, and yet over time, there's something about it that grows on you. It is also a very simple game, but in playing it, you may begin to realize that it's simplicity with a purpose. For many fans, this was their first exposure to Marth in his own series context, and their first chance to experience his journey throughout Arcanea on his quest to reclaim his homeland. Today, on the Fire Emblem Retrospective, we will once again be examining this journey, and discovering the ways that this entry in the series both stood on the shoulders of its predecessors, yet also blazed its own path. With my goal of completing each game in this series twice, this game actually represents the fifth and sixth time I have made my way through this specific journey. Even still, I was surprised to find that there was a lot to unpack and examine. Let's go ahead and get that started. Unsurprisingly, the release and poor sales performance of the two prior games, Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, put the development of the next Fire Emblem into a whole new context. Despite trying and failing to land back on the home console twice, the next game in the series was originally planned to be released for the Wii. This was not met with enthusiasm from the staff at Nintendo, who suggested that they probably shouldn't release another Fire Emblem on a home console, due to how niche they perceived the series to be. At first, this message was interpreted as meaning that the series needed to broaden its appeal. In order to get a fresh take, the massive Fire Emblem team of Radiant Dawn was drastically reduced in size. And with this done, they then began to take the upcoming Fire Emblem Wii in a very different direction. According to Toru Narihiro, director of The Binding Blade and a longtime producer for the series, many different ideas were thrown about at this time, such as the player being able to bring a massive army with you, Pikmin style, everywhere you go. It's a bit hard to understand exactly what he meant nowadays, but whatever the case, ultimately this project fizzled out. It was Kohei Maeda, a writer and planner since The Blazing Blade, who got the ball rolling once more expressing his desire to become a director and to reintroduce marriage into the series so that they could kickstart that mass appeal. Ultimately, he was passed over for this entry, but if you know the future of this series development, then what he had just proposed should sound a little bit familiar. Longtime project coordinator for Nintendo Masaki Tawara became the director, taking the series back to a portable system yet again. It was decided to remake the very first game, 
which had already seen an altered revision seen in Book 1 of the third game, Mystery of the Emblem. Despite the journey of Marth having already been retread one time, the team really wished that players outside of Japan would be able to experience his story for themselves. And going back to redo this entry also meant that they could fix some of the issues with Mystery of the Emblem's version, which had to cut five levels and some playable characters due to Super Famicom's storage limitations. Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon was viewed internally as more of a renewal rather than a remake. This meant that multiple new mechanics were implemented for the first time, and the team even went out of their way to add five new Gaiden chapters, each with new recruitable characters. Even with these new chapters and units, a concerted effort was made to not overcomplicate the story. And though much more dialogue was added, which fleshed out the cast tremendously compared to their previous outings, the team was committed to keeping the atmosphere as close as possible to the original. Yet again, they used a guest artist for the visual design, with Masamune Shiro of Ghost in the Shell fame redesigning Marth, Sita, and many of the other more prominent members of this cast. After serving as a sound supervisor since the seventh game, none other than Yuka Tsujioko returned back to a more direct role, serving as Shadow Dragon's composer. This of course was a natural fit, since it was her who had composed the music for the original game nearly 18 years prior. With the ball finally rolling, development only took 10 months to complete, with the game releasing on April 7th, 2008 in Japan, with Western releases in December of the same year and February of 2009. Along with positive reviews from a number of outlets, sales for the game thankfully went up, with this game easily outselling both of the previous entries. However, very strangely, sales numbers for this game were higher in Japan than in the West, which definitely wasn't a great sign given how much larger the Western market is compared to Japan's. This was very quickly noted, as it showed that the series had maintained an invested audience in its home country, but in the West, much of the attention since the successful Game Boy Advance games seemed to have mostly worn off. After the panic-inducing results of the last two entries' sales performance, this game succeeding was a slight ray of hope, although it was one that would soon be interpreted in a disastrous way. We'll be getting into that, naturally, in the next video. For now, we will be moving on to covering the plot. Technically, I have told this story two previous times, but I still find it important to do it here as well. Even the most complete fan translation of the original game continues to be extremely rough. And of course, that was on top of the lack of storytelling capabilities that the Famicom already had. Of course, the second retelling, Fire Emblem 3, which had a better fan translation, still had to cut out large portions of the original in order to fit in the real meat of that game, which was the Book 2 sequel section. Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon is the only official English translation for these events. But on top of that, the vastly improved storytelling and writing has gone on to make it the definitive version for all regions. As always, I will provide links for those who wish to jump right to the story analysis section at the top of the screen, or a link to the start of the gameplay sections at the bottom for people who want to avoid all story spoilers whatsoever. Alright everybody, let's get going in 3, 2, 1. Long ago, in the land of Arcanea, the king of the dragons, Medius, ruled the continent with fear and despair. In response to the tyranny of his wretched rule, a hero hailing from the small nation of Altea appeared, wielding a shimmering blade. This man, Anri, challenged the evil dragon, and ultimately prevailed. One hundred years of peace followed him, but eventually, the dark dragon Medius returned to the world. He seized power in the land of the dragons, Dolor, and began gathering allies for his second conquest of the continent. Nation after nation submitted or fell to the Shadow Dragon's power, and it was now up to the current ruler of Altea, King Cornelius, to wield Anri's blade, the Falchion, against the tides of darkness yet again. While the king sallied forth, it was up to his royal children, Princess Elise and Prince Marth, to maintain the castle with the queen, and to host a garrison of troops from Altea's neighboring ally, Gra. 
Although Prince Marth's days of training both the pen and the sword passed without incident, all of this would soon change. One day, the same as any other, Marth was suddenly awoken by a castle guardsman, who had been seeking him on behalf of his sister. And as Marth was going to the throne room to try to find her, he was shocked to see soldiers of Gra within the castle, working together to try to apprehend him. After proving to them that the son of Cornelius was not to be underestimated, Marth reunited with his sister, who informed him that they had all been betrayed. Gra had chosen to side with Dolor, and had turned on their father, slaying him in the field of battle. Now, the entire castle was under attack, as their former ally soldiers were frantically searching for the both of them, hoping to wipe out the bloodline of Anri on behalf of their new master. Elise implored her brother to flee, choosing to stay behind herself instead. Marth quickly gathered his guardsmen around him, and together they fought to secure the young prince's future, even with their very lives if they had to. As Marth escaped by sea, he vowed to return one day, and to right all the wrongs which had been so unjustly delivered onto him. For the next three years, Marth remained hidden as a guest in the tiny island nation of Talis. He was even given a fort to man there with his own personal troops. Over time, he grew quite close to his host nation's Princess Sita, and so when she arrived suddenly one day pleading for his help with a recent pirate threat, the prince was all too happy to assist her. After easily dealing with the raiders, the king of Talos himself acknowledged how strong the prince and his followers had become, and that it was finally time for them to begin their counterattack. After being granted some of the most powerful fighters of Talos, Marth sailed west, arriving in the kingdom of Aurelis. And as he battled through both bandit and soldiers standing in his way, he would gather more and more powerful allies, drawn in either by the kindness of Princess Sita or the righteousness of the prince's cause. At the gates of Aurelis Castle, Marth was met by Duke Hardin, the younger brother of the local king and a fiercely powerful cavalry commander. Joining their two forces together, the princes were able to overcome the forces of Dolor within, and the first of many nations to come was finally liberated from evil's control. Within the castle, Marth was met by an unexpected guest, Princess Nina, hailing from the massive nation of Arcanea. Her kingdom, for which the continent was also named, was in many ways the mother country to all of the other kingdoms throughout the land, including Marth's own home of Altea. As the heir to Arcanea, it was Nina's role to protect all of the nations in a time of crisis, a task which she was woefully unable to do in her current situation. What she could do, at the very least, was choose a champion, and adorn him with a symbol of her family's trust. Marth was presented with such a symbol, the Fire Emblem, a holy object which was only to be bestowed to a true hero, one who was believed had the power to save the world. With this act, Marth's cause now had full legitimacy, granted by the most powerful royal family in the land. With this, his group became known as the Arcanean League. For those living under the tyranny of Medius, Marth's fight represented hope, and soon many others, such as the warrior princess Minerva of Macedon, were seeking out his help. After gaining ever more allies, the League finally arrived in Nina's homeland, and after launching a long siege on the castle, finally wrestled control away from the forces of Dolor. With half of the continent free, the next stop on the prince's journey would be a personal one, as he now set his sights on Gra the land that had betrayed his family so long ago. At that time, three years ago, the prince had been nothing but a weak boy, fleeing for his life thanks to the sacrifice of others. Now, with the might of many loyal soldiers from all over the continent at his command, the tables had completely turned. Though the soldiers of Gra had personally seen to King Cornelius' death on that fateful day many years back, his divine blade, the Falchion, was not to be found within their castle. Luckily, through careful search, Marth's group was able to learn that it had been taken away by Garnif, a fearsomely powerful dark magician who was also one of the Shadow Dragon's first and closest allies, located currently in the northern Magic Kingdom of Cadane. In the sands of this land, the Arcanan League were finally able to confront the magician, but they soon found that no sword, spear, axe, arrow, or magic could possibly break through the barrier of dark magic he commanded. After Garnif grew bored of this show and vanished to parts unknown, Marth was suddenly telepathically contacted by the sage Goto, the very man who had taught Garnif before his dark turn. 
To defeat the mage and retrieve his family's sword, Marth would need to craft the Magic of Starlight, which could only be done by retrieving two powerful orbs from a temple nearby and personally delivering them to Goto in the heavily guarded kingdom of Macedon. With this goal in mind, the League continued, with little stopping them from finally liberating Marth's homeland of Altea. Though he would have wished to stay here if he could, their current need elsewhere in the continent was too great, and so they continued on to the temple. Inside, they found not only the star and light orbs needed, but a fiercely powerful opponent, a member of the nearly extinct tribe of divine dragons, the young Manakit Tiki. Mind controlled by Garnif, Tiki challenged the group, but rather than blades, it was words that caused her to stand down, as her caretaker Bantu, who had been traveling with Marth for some time, was able to help the dragon princess break the spell that had clouded her mind. One divine dragon's power was worth legions of lesser dragons, and in Tiki, Marth had gained not only a new friend, but a devastating new ally to help him resist the Shadow Dragon and his most powerful dragon troops. With the objects needed for Starlight in hand, Marth's group next marched through the land of Grust, and came toe-to-toe -to -toe with the noble yet fiercely loyal General Camus. Camus had been the man who had personally prevented Princess Nina from being executed, following her nation's fall. But despite the love that the two shared for each other, the general refused to betray his home country for their side, and soon he too had to fall at the League's hands. Though this resulted in utter heartbreak for Princess Nina, at last very little remained of the Dolor Alliance. Now, even though Macedon's King Mikolas, the brother of Princess Minerva, threw everything he had at them, it was not nearly enough to stop the League, and eventually he too would see the end of his rules at the hand of Marth. With the fighting in Macedon quelled, Marth was able to meet with Goto and deliver the requested orbs, which were immediately used to create the magic needed to defeat Garnif's power. The only tasks that still remained were retrieving the falchion from Garnif and turning the holy blade on his master, the shadow dragon Medius. Thanks to Goto's power, the Arcanaean League was teleported right to Garnif's location, and after the power of starlight broke the dark magician's barrier and saw to his end, Marth retrieved not only his family's divine blade, but also his sister Elise, who had been kept alive at the will of Garnif due to her own magical ability. With nothing left between him and the mastermind of the continent's current woes, Marth and company were once again teleported by Goto, landing straight in the land of Dolor. With Medius unable to manifest his power outside of the castle just yet, all the dragon could do was wait for the prince, who by now had proven himself to be a truly worthy foe. Before long, the blood of Anri and the fangs of the shadow dragon would once again face off in battle. Just as his ancestor had done a century before, Marth struck down the dragon, who was yet again disgusted to fall at the hand of a mere human. Promising to return as long as darkness remained in the world, Medius finally disappeared. With the dragon's defeat, peace had once again been restored to Arcanea, as the many allies who had all gathered around the prince over this past year returned back to their homes and families, the prince's final battle was won for his own happiness. Thanks to his dear friend Nina, Marth was able to muster his courage and ask Sita to remain with him, forever at his side. The tale of the Shadow Dragon and the Sword of Light had finally drawn to a close. For now. Analyzing the story of Shadow Dragon is trickier than it seems. Like the original game, Shadow Dragon is an extremely straightforward adventure when looked at broadly. Unlike the original, this wasn't done because of limitations in the hardware. Rather, this was a very deliberate choice. Even though this entry does update and flesh out some elements of the plot, this is still easily the most simplistic a Fire Emblem game story has been since the very first game. The trick to seeing the value of this game's storytelling is in realizing if that is a bad thing or not to you. For anyone tracking the history of the series, I imagine that they might see Shadow Dragon as a major step back. Technically, it is true. Anyone can look at this Radiant Dawn footage and compare it to what this game did and immediately see the degradation. And I'm not just talking in terms of graphical power. We are basically back to the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem style of using still art with text to depict important scenes, even though this is far from what the DS was actually capable of. 
Here's the thing though, if the game was able to achieve its storytelling goal, which in this case was maintaining the atmosphere of the Famicom original in order to craft a deliberately classic feeling experience, then how much weight does decrying the game for its simplicity really carry? A game story is not inherently improved due to it being more complex, nor is it inherently worsened due to it being simpler. What matters to me is how well each of these types of stories embody the values that they each suggest. An epic story needs an epic scope, something that is difficult to depict with just overhead 2D sprites. That's not saying that it is impossible to do, but this type of story is better served being in 3D, which can allow for a more dynamic depiction of the events. If a game is reaching for a broadly epic tale, then a lot of this great potential can be lost through using an overly simple script, which I think is what led to a big problem in Radiant Dawn, something that I elaborated on in the last video. Shadow Dragon isn't trying to do anything like this, and it ends up being exactly what it needs to be. It's a simple story told in a simple way, and although there's nothing that will really wow the player or create as powerful of an emotional response as a game like Thracia 776 or Genealogy of the Holy War, I still found it really easy to enjoy. I admit that part of my enjoyment of this script is due to my experience of playing both Fire Emblems 1 and 3 with their admittedly limited scripts and fan translations. Even though I have seen this story multiple times over, in my native language no less, Shadow Dragon still feels like the first time I'm really meeting this cast, even without a structured support system which has now completely fallen away after Radiant Dawn's limited showing, one thing that Shadow Dragon has in abundance is evocative and efficient writing. Even though Intelligent Systems seems to think that not much was actually added to the story, stating precisely as much in an interview from the 25th anniversary book The Making of Fire Emblem, they might be underestimating the generous amount of characterization that, that was actually added here. As a matter of fact, the game script was so weighty that the translation had to be outsourced to a different company rather than being handled internally at Nintendo. The company 8-4 were responsible for this translation. Rather than merely translating the words on the screen to their English equivalents and calling it a job, which I think is a pitfall of many fan translations and even official translation rush jobs, 8-4 specializes in carefully crafting a game script to convey the same experience as the Japanese original. In this respect, they did an absolutely amazing job. Even without each individual character having a flood of dialogue, the personalities of many of these characters definitely shine through, which I think really illustrate individual aspects of them, such as the extreme crazy loyalty of Ogma, and the true kindness and possibly slight manipulativeness of Sita. I also want to give a special mention to Princess Elise, who actually became a real character in this game, as well as all of the other new additions to this cast, who I think all slot in very well. Oftentimes, recreating an 8-bit era game with a more modern perspective gives developers too easy of an out when it comes to re-scripting things. Incredibly, that is not what happened here. Shadow Dragon is actually very smartly written. Its return to this simple story sets a very different tone, and refusing the impulse to completely replace what came before in favor of enhancing what already existed, to me, shows a remarkable level of restraint. The light, breezy tone that it sticks to is a testament to the roots of this project. The more direct, goal-based story setup combined with very enjoyable character scenes had me flashing back to some of the characterization in Genealogy of the Holy War and the excellent Project Naga translation. It also took me back to memories from even earlier in my life, playing games like A Link to the Past on the first console I ever owned. This kind of enjoyable but not overly convoluted writing makes the game easy to pick up, easy to put down, and easy to return to. There is plenty of value in that kind of experience, and it goes to show how critical giving a game a worthwhile translation really is. After experiencing Shadow Dragon twice, I feel like I'm finally seeing the Arcanean characters with the same kind of fondness that Japanese players must have been doing since the early days of this series. Though the writing itself contributes a lot, when it comes to painting this comforting emotional landscape, it's fair to say that the gameplay is just as responsible for this as the story. Let's get into that next.
The last time that any Fire Emblem game shook up the formula so dramatically from one game to another, the series creator Shozo Kaga had just left Intelligent Systems completely. Like the Binding Blade before it, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon was ruthless in how many long-running systems it hacked off itself, stopping just short of regressing back to the days of the early Super Famicom games. About the only additional systems that remain that weren't in the original game are the Weapon Triangle system, Weapon Proficiency system, and Weapon Forging. Character skills are gone, the C to A support system is gone, bonus experience, charging transformation forms, tier 3 classes, canto, shove, rescue, auto promotion, they have all been cut. Almost every new addition since the Binding Blade is not here. And though this seems obvious since we are returning to the Arcanean games, remember that even in Mystery of the Emblems version of this game, the Weapon Triangle system didn't even exist yet. Of these implanted inclusions, the deliberate incorporation of both the Weapon Triangle system and Weapon Forging are more than enough to completely change how this game is played. These changes are so significant that when you seriously start to consider this game versus either previous version, calling it simply a remake struggles to have any useful meaning. To get what I mean by this, an understanding of the originals is required, and I'm not sure that this is an understanding that many people have. Not many people play Fire Emblem 1, and probably at this point even less people play Mystery of the Emblem. I really have no doubt that for many watching this video, the exact specifics of that era in the franchise continue to be somewhat vague. I'll try to clear things up briefly here. In both Fire Emblems 1 and 3, the difference between sword, axe, and spear was only seen in their hit rate, damage, and weight. No weapon had any innate advantage over the other. There was no real drawback to assigning the baddies all one kind of weapon or one kind of class throughout a whole map. This was also true for the bosses. Since every map in the game was a siege map, every chapter had to have its own boss, with a large majority of them being either an armor knight, cavalier, or either of their promotions. In the originals, this made for an actual challenge, since it was harder back then to overcome their accuracy, damage, and high defense without any extra systems helping you along. This entire setup is kept in Shadow Dragon, from very consistent enemy types to the repeated use of the same classes for bosses. While this is quite obviously not suited for the weapon triangle due to how it makes certain units more or less useful for very long periods of time, it's actually the weapon forging system which turns the original game's intentions into a complete joke here. Rather than forging completely new weapons, as was done in the past, in this entry you can now improve any weapon in your inventory. And, this is really important, this also includes special effective weapons. What this means is that you could now take something like a hammer, the staple armor killer for Axemen, and use forging to make up for its horrendous accuracy as well as giving it a lot more power or crit chance. While Radiant Dawn limited you to only plus 5 in any of these stats, Shadow Dragon has raised that to 10. Due to how effective damage in these games work, if you're using these weapons against their effective damage targets, every one of these points is actually worth 3, which means that if you've got the gold, you can add up to 30 more damage to every one of your strikes against armored foes. Of course, the most infamous example of this broken forging system is in Sita's Wing Spear, an exclusive weapon for her that does effective damage on both armor knights and cavalry. Though Sita initially struggles with her strength stat, she will consistently have great speed and hit chance, meaning that you really just need to improve the power of this spear in order to have access to one of the most broken characters ever seen in a Fire Emblem game. With the constant ability to fly and gaining Iot's shield later in the game to negate her weakness to arrows, Sita's power in Shadow Dragon is rightly infamous. Yet another example of turning the reused old into the newly broken comes in the form of the Ballistician units, Jake and Beck, who function like low movement archers who can fire at enemies up to 10 spaces away. In the original, they weren't so great. Their utility, which amounts to pretty much free damage against any enemy in their range, was very much balanced around them having an extremely low hit rate. In this version, if you understand the power of forging at this point, you can see how this isn't actually a problem at all, and rather turns them into two of the best characters in the game. 
With a little bit of gold, you can boost that accuracy right up, as well as a healthy dose of power, allowing you to one-shot any enemies in range that you wish, and even sometimes two-shotting the bosses. With the abundance of warp staves in this game, and this kind of power at your fingertips, Shadow Dragon plays a lot faster than any game in this franchise before it. Which is ironic considering that it's the tedium of the original versions that keeps most players from experiencing them these days. I imagine if I'd played these out of order, it would be really hard to go back. And that's not even mentioning the host of other quality of life features that were added here, like the ability to skip through animations even when they're turned on, which which includes skipping entire enemy turns if you wish, as well as being able to see every possible danger zone at the push of a button. FE11, more so than any other entry before it, seems like it was built for you to go back for more, to keep pushing yourself to do better and better, until the tricks you've learned can no longer break it as hard as they could on your initial runs. This was done primarily by making this game one of the most modular and self-correcting games I have ever seen in my life, which is precisely what we need to talk about next. For as long as the Fire Emblem games have endured at this point, the stigma of being a niche experience has been unavoidable. Even if you personally enjoy the following characteristics, to the masses these games are perceived as being overly complex, RNG-heavy, very unwelcoming games for beginners. I hope that this entire retrospective series by now has proved that these are untrue statements. After all, few people can claim to have been as ignorant as I was when I was starting this whole thing, and yet I've made it all the way to this point gladly. Still, even with some of the later, very popular games in the series, I think it's fair to argue that this impression, uninformed as it may be, has never really gone away. In the eyes of a novice, no feature of these games is more intimidating than the permanent death system. If this game is about building your army, then nothing else is so blatantly intimidating than the thought that, if you do make a major mistake, not only will you be punished for it, you will also suffer permanent loss. People want a challenge, sure, but nobody wants to suffer while they're just trying to learn. Of course this isn't the truth of the matter, unit permadeath has always been a purposeful feature, it's not one that's put in merely to punish the players. These are games that are designed around this whole feature, and this has always been true even since the very first game, which actually put in hordes of replacement characters throughout the entire journey to ensure you'd never be undermanned. There's a quote that I see over and over again concerning the issue of permanent death. It usually goes something like this. I hate having to start over whenever I lose a unit. It's either start over or lose hours and hours of work. I'm fairly confident that a lot of Fire Emblem fans have had this feeling at some point, and I'll admit that includes myself. This is why I think it's fair to stop and ask, why do you have to restart when you lose a non-essential unit? This need to constantly reset, the need to do things perfectly. I do think it comes from a good place, but it's not a mindset that these games were meant to be played with. From the beginning of this series, Shozo Kaga, the father of Fire Emblem himself, offered a word of advice to his players. It's not a big problem if some of your characters die. Don't get caught up trying to get a perfect ending. Have fun. I have to ask you, what is the actual, measurable consequence of losing a plot-optional unit? Maybe it's that you miss out on a bit of lackluster text at the end of the game. Or maybe it's some kind of nebulous fear of missing out. The issue here, like the outsider's concept of what Fire Emblem is, lies in our own misguided perceptions. Just like how a story without conflict isn't much of a story, forcing a lack of hardship onto your gameplay experience is similarly self-defeating. It removes the nuanced emotion that a journey through these games can bring, both positive and negative. I can understand not wanting to let this happen on your very first run, since there is a valid desire to want to meet the whole cast if you can. Still, I can tell you from my own experiences that by now I have learned that when I let this overly protective mindset go, I always end up having a far better time playing these games. I would honestly wager that many of these players who force themselves to reset constantly would actually not be too terribly bothered to be reminded that they lost a character at some point in the game. 
And even if they are, I'd argue that the negative feeling associated with that is far better than the alternative strategy. The alternative I'm talking about here is playing these games like some kind of nervous wreck. You can't make mistakes. You can't allow failure. Your units must survive and you will arena abuse, grind endlessly, or save scum as much as necessary to make it so. Some players do simply like doing this, and I'm not trying to shame them here. But at the same time, I believe that continually submitting yourself to these kind of tactics can also lead to becoming stuck in your own self-limiting mindset. One may start to believe that they can't beat these games without doing these things simply because they've never gone outside it. Just as I've seen with games like the infamous Thracia 776 and the niche-only stigma of this entire series, the most alluring lies of all are the ones that we tell ourselves. So, why in the world am I bringing this up now, of all times, in the 11th video of this series? The reason for this is simple. Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon represents the beginning of a significant shift in this series, away from design priorities which had lasted for over 18 years. For the direction that this series wanted to go, it was a necessary change. But even though the next game will mark the introduction of a true casual mode, the steps that Fire Emblem 11 took to try to meet the same goals beforehand do need acknowledging. I really get the feeling that the staff and intelligence systems wasn't fully ready to allow permadeath to no longer be a concern for their players, resulting in what, from the outside, seem like absolutely ridiculous design decisions that will actually make perfect sense in a new light. Why in the world, many ask, would this game bother to put in multiple new side missions, each with a completely new recruitable character, but then limit access to those missions to players who have lost a large amount of units already? Well, this is for the same reason that the prologue of this game forces everyone, literally every single player, to sacrifice at least one unit to the enemy. It wants to teach its players the same thing that Shozo Kaga said over a decade back. Death is a feature of this game. Don't get caught up trying to get a perfect ending here. In this game, you literally cannot. These side missions are but one of the many, many safety net features which it uses to guard all its players, and to teach them to keep moving on. Players who refuse to allow loss, or to allow any amount of chaos to seep into their perfect playthroughs, are banned from seeing these missions, or from meeting these characters. Here I have to say that, even if you are willing to let your characters die, meeting the under 15 requirement, especially since this game reinforces you with faceless generic characters when you're too low at times, is probably too low a number. Still, I do think the attempt to nudge players in this direction rather than push them is definitely admirable. If there were any game that made getting out of your comfort zone as painless as possible, it would definitely be Shadow Dragon above all of its predecessors. With its incredibly fast gameplay speed, the same battles that would take me hours on my original runs could be 20 minute affairs here. Not only does the game have your back if you lose a unit in the two ways I mentioned previously, but we also have the new class change system, which allows you to reclass nearly all of your units. This not only gives you the freedom to make whatever kind of team you want to experiment with, but it can also allow players who have had units die to fill in gaps in their team, if, for example, they were to lose their only healer or magic user. This game is by far the most easily replayable Fire Emblem which I think is why the developers even dared to include five levels of its hard mode. Both of my full runs were actually only about 15 hour affairs, and with animations always off or unnecessary enemy turns skipped, which I couldn't really do because I needed to capture footage, this playtime could likely have dropped even closer to 10, or maybe even under it. So you finished normal. Why not try hard one? It's not that much of an investment of your time. Well, you finished hard one, why not try hard too? You've already learned so much about this game. This approach, I think, is significantly less intimidating than suddenly bumping a player up to one of its very hardest difficulty settings. And all in all, the changes here were an admirable attempt to try to begin to appeal to players of many different stripes. Though the changes seen here were far from overwhelming, all of these additions were signs of the inevitable. Fire Emblem was going to change. Whether that was all for good or ill is something that we'll have to examine more in the future. For now, at last, it's time that we wrap everything up.
For a game that many questioned if I would even want to cover, I have found more to consider than I ever thought possible here. In terms of gameplay, it was by far one of my favorites. Even after finishing it twice, I would happily return to it yet again, trying new compositions or tactics, maybe relying less on the overpowered forges or convenience warping all the while possibly bumping up the difficulty another notch. On top of the invigorating gameplay speed and possibility space, the charms of the character writing and scenarios, as simple as they are, further add to the refreshingly classic and arcadey fun that this entry has in spades. There's a pureness in vision here, one that took a team willing to throw away what they thought they knew they wanted in order to open the series to more ambitious changes. There is definitely a certain stagnation in this direction, very little in this game can be said to be truly new other than a few design priorities. Still, I think that the best word for my overall experience returning to Arcanea yet again could only be refreshing. It was great to come back here again, to see this cast and these events in a new, more competently crafted stage. I loved seeing the playability of this series make a huge leap forward. And it was also really interesting to see the beginnings of some changes that were happening. Changes that were implemented without the developers feeling the need to throw out absolutely everything in order to make it so. Still, I'm not sure that I would consider this game one of my favorites, but I would probably say that I had a lot more fun on a minute-to-minute -minute basis than I did for many of my actual favorites thus far. If I cared about nothing but gameplay, I could very easily see myself getting lost in it over and over again. I loved the experience of playing Shadow Dragon, and of course, I definitely recommend it, but I'm not sure that I would call this one necessary. It was fantastic to play, but I wonder what the legacy of it will really be as I continue to make my way through this wonderful series. On our next stop on the Fire Emblem Retrospective, we will once again return to Command Marth as he faces a new mysterious threat. Join me then as we take on enemies unforeseen in Fire Emblem 12, New Mystery of the Emblem. If you don't feel like waiting, you can watch the New Mystery of the Emblem Retrospective right now. All you need to do is click the link on screen or in the description to become a Patreon supporter. For as little as $1, you can gain one week early access to my videos, including the next retrospective video, which just became available right now. If you wish to support for more, you can gain further benefits, such as being able to watch all four videos in a current season of Retrospectives for three, or gain immediate access to everything I do without having to wait for a season's completion for five. Please consider helping my channel grow and this series continue with your support today. Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to give a special thank you to Connie Reed, DW7 Still Rules, Henry Gutierrez, Ignis Isel, Jesus Ruiz, Radiant Archiver, Ryan Poe, and True Tactician, as well as to all of my other supporters who make these videos possible by donating on Patreon. Thank you all very much.